Hi folks, so we're going to talk about one of the key enzymes of gluconeogenesis. This is pyruvate carboxylase. This does a couple of things. First thing it does, of course, is add a carbon, uh, carboxy group, a COO, onto pyruvate to make an oxaloacetate. So our balanced equation is going to be pyruvate plus ATP plus HCO3 minus, that's bicarbonate. This is a normal product of uh, CO2 in your blood or in your, uh, in your cytoplasm. And that's going to form oxaloacetate, which is a part of the Krebs cycle, plus ADP. Now this is a good example of an anaplerotic reaction. Anaplerotic. That means cycle filling. And cycle filling reactions are used to, for example, refill the Krebs cycle if you start to use oxaloacetate for different things. Uh, for example, you can use that to make an aspartic acid um, in, from that direct intermediate if you wanted to make amino acids. And so sometimes you'll take old pyruvates that you have that are ready to enter Krebs cycle, and you'll do the carboxylase reaction so you get more oxaloacetate to run the Krebs cycle off. So this is one, our first example of an anaplerotic reaction. And you'll see these all over the place, especially now that we're getting into Krebs cycle. So if you notice, we have the bicarbonate, we have an ATP in the end active site. We also have our first appearance of biotin, vitamin B7. It's an essential B vitamin that we use uh, to do any kind of carboxylation. So if anytime you see a carboxylase, it's going to have a biotin in its active site. You also have, you can see this glutamic acid, which is going to be used for acid-base transfers. So the first step of this reaction is to form the species that gives the CO2 to pyruvate, the carboxylating agent. And that is our bicarbonate. And our bicarbonate, you can see, looks like a CO, CO2 with an OH hanging off of it. So we need to get that OH off. The way we do that is by attacking a ATP. So we're going to pull out the hydrogen. That bond is going to go attack the gamma phosphate. Gamma phosphate is going to break its uh, double bond O. It's going to come back down, and it's going to displace our ADP. Okay. So we are going to now have attached our bicarbonate onto this phosphate and kick off this ADP. The ADP is going to leave our active site. Okay. Now we've formed an intermediate called carbonyl phosphate, which is a key carboxylating agent. You can actually see the CO2 is here. Here's the phosphate piece. And the only reason that this happens is so that the CO2 can be made available. And remember, it's to move, the, take off the OH off of bicarbonate. Um, so this thing is just kind of a reactive species, just like all anhydrides. This oxygen kind of is a problem because resonance forms can't cross it very easily. Uh, and so this makes both sides of this reaction very, very reactive. And especially the CO2 here, which all it needs to do is collapse to make a CO2 molecule, and it can kick off this good leaving group, the phosphate. So that's what's actually going to happen here. It's coordinated in and held in by this hydrogen, um, but it's not strong enough to hold it back, and so it's going to collapse to form the CO2, kick off the phosphate. Then this phosphate is actually going to be able to be nucleophilic enough, or basic enough in this case, to pull a hydrogen off of the biotin. Now nitrogen is not very electronegative, well it's the second, uh, third most electronegative element uh, in the periodic table, but oxygen nearby is even more electronegative. And so oxygen is going to be the one that actually ends up with the pair. So we're going to push charge up onto that oxygen and we're going to generate kind of like an enol intermediate. Of course, when we make an O here we can also coordinate to this arginine so we get a little bit of a charge-charge attraction. And so what we've done here is now freed up our CO2. Our phosphate is, is now free, and it's protonated like it should be. We have now a biotin derivative in kind of like uh, an enol or enolate coordinated to our enzyme, and we're ready to introduce the pyruvate to the reaction almost. Now the first, what we're going to do in the next step is we're going to make a key intermediate car carboxybiotin, which is actually the thing that transfers the CO2 onto pyruvate. So you can see here we have our enolate kind of thing on biotin. We have our free phosphate, so that can feel free to us to leave. Uh, but now we have this CO2 just floating around, and we have this enol. And as we know, enols like to collapse, and so that's exactly what's going to happen here. 
phenols want to become ketones. It's their greatest aspiration, uh, chemically speaking, in life. Uh, and so that double bond O is going to come down. Now, we're going to break octet at that carbon. So this bond needs to be freed to attack the CO2. If we attack the CO2, we have to break a bond. And now we've attached the CO2 onto biotin. It makes a carboxybiotin. And once we form this, we can pretty much bi biotinylate or carboxy, add the carboxy group from biotin uh, onto anything we're looking at. As long as there is a key feature we'll talk about here. So we have our carboxy biotin shown. We see the CO2 is ready to go onto our substrate, but there's nowhere to add it. Now, the only places we can add carboxy groups are places where we have an alpha enol, uh, an alpha uh, carbanion. And so the only place we can put an alpha carbanion on pyruvate is right here. So we need to get that thing off of there so we can add uh, a pair that we can use to attack. But we're kind of in a, a jam here because our carboxyl group is held tightly. Our pyruvate needs to get this hydrogen off. And so kind of one thing to remember about carboxylations is that CO2s are very labile. They'll fly, they'll go off and on pretty easily. All you need to do is do this to cause a leaving group to be expanded, expelled. And you can see again that we're going to do the same old thing, generate a negative charge, get a charge charge attraction back, and we're going to free up our CO2. So there's our free CO2. Again, it's held in place by this glut glutamic acid. And again, we have this enolate kind of biotin. Now, just like last time, we're going to do, in this case, a base transfer. Now, notice that we have, again, our alpha carbon um, has this rather acidic hydrogen on it, and we're going to use that to generate the enolate intermediate. This bond electron is going to come to C double bond C, and we're going to push electrons up onto the oxygen, very similar to what we did on the last step with our biotin. So the same kinds of principles happen. Collapse the double bond, use this to pull out a hydrogen off of the alpha carbon, generate the enolate, and then we're ready to start adding our CO2. Here is our enol pyruvate. This may look familiar from pyruvate kinase, um, which was a key, it's an intermediate for the last step of glycolysis. But remember that making uh, phosphoenol pyruvate is tough because now we're going to need to add a phosphate here. We're not ready for that yet. We're making an intermediate in the steps going back up to uh, phosphoenol pyruvate in gluconeogenesis. But now we do have this alpha reactivity here at the end of the enol. And we have this enolate, it's ready to collapse, so let's do that. If we collapse, we're ready to attack. So, so now that's all done, we have effectively added the CO2 to the end of pyruvate. Now that is going to lengthen it by a single carbon, uh, and it's going to also give us the ability to decarboxylate it uh, in the next step of gluconeogenesis. So we end this reaction with a recharged biotin um, and oxaloacetate, which is a member of the Krebs cycle. And so we have done an anaplerotic reaction. We can now have filled in part of the Krebs cycle with oxaloacetate. Of course, in the next step, we're going to take this and use it to make uh, phosphoenol pyruvate. So this is one of the two steps in the bypass uh, of pyruvate kinase.